Good to be with you all tonight. Glad you're here. Uh, I'm glad you're watching online for those that are watching online. Uh, every time they announce the youth group playing volleyball next week, I'm slightly more offended because my older son uh, came to me about a month ago now and said he had been chosen as the adult to play on one of the teams. And I went to Thorin's office uh, the next week and I said, Thorin, do you not know that I was on the D-team championship team for club uh, volleyball in college a long time ago? D-team. And he laughed. Uh, I'll have you know it was D-1, not D-2. So, uh, and D-2 is as far as it went, and that's all you need to know about my volleyball skills. My wife has the volleyball skills in the family. She was like a high school volleyball champion person, so I, I'm just trying to get back over the net. Anyhow, um, if you have a bulletin and you have been planning ahead because you saw the sermon title was Fields and you're looking at the slide and you're saying he lied to us, uh, I changed my mind. Um, I was leaning a little bit and then my wife said something to me that reminded me of something I said last week that indicated where I was going next and I had forgotten I said that um, because I would actually planned to go there two weeks out and so I decided to swap them. Uh, and so this is actually what would have been two weeks out in my mind, but apparently on what I said the first week, it should have been this week. So keep all that straight. But anyhow, fields will be next time. Uh, and this time we will be talking about he wants them found. Uh, and so just to give you a little indication of where we're going, next time we're going to talk a little bit about who the lost are uh, and who the, the people around us in our communities and in our, uh, our neighborhoods and in our world are that are looking for Jesus and kind of some characteristics we can see of them and maybe a little bit about who we are and who we should be. Uh, but this time, I want us to look at what God has to say about the lost, and maybe some practical things, which is what I left off with last time I'd forgotten about, uh, some practical things about what we can do. Uh, we kind of had a more negative slant last time of what we're not doing when it comes to evangelism. This time, we'll look a little bit as to what we can do, uh, at least in getting started. So, as we begin, uh, I like this quote from Francis Chan. It says, from the beginning of Christianity... The overflow of being a disciple of Jesus has always been to make disciples of Jesus. I like the language of overflow because it's something we can see. We actually uh, uh, got takeout for lunch today, and uh, we brought it home, and my wife was pouring drinks on the counter, and she did that game that I like to play a lot of times, which is, can I beat the foam on the Coke Zero or not? Uh, and so she was pouring it, and the next thing I know, she's, she made a, a sigh, kind of like I would make. And the Coke Zero is beginning to overflow out of this cup because it's just foaming up so much. We get the idea of overflow. Uh, when you have just guessed, you think it'll reach this level and it goes a little further than you think it will. I want you to think of that in terms of our Christianity because that's kind of a biblical idea too. We have a lot of places in scripture where this idea of the overflow is there. If we are Christians and we are living the Christian life, then it cannot be fully contained within us if we're doing it the way God intended. Uh, this should not be something where you can be exactly the follower of God that he has designed you to be, and no one ever realizes you are. That, that just wouldn't make sense. And so the, part of the overflow of being a disciple of Jesus is you are naturally going to want to go out and make more disciples of Jesus. Now, here's the struggle. For a lot of people, as they hear that, uh, people watching online, people around the world who go to different churches, some of us in this room, you may not feel that way. Uh, or if you do feel that way, you may not live that way, which is to say there have been a lot of things that have flowed out of you being a Christian, you know, joy through struggles, uh, your ability to have faith when things are difficult, sometimes just being happy about life in general. Uh, there's a hospitality that comes out of you. There's a love for God that comes from you. But the idea of making disciples coming out is something very different. Uh, and I really think Chan is on to something here with the idea that if we are doing this in the right way, this should be another of those things that just, it can't be contained. It's something that comes out of us. So I want to think of this through the lens of the lost parables in Luke 15. Uh, you have uh, the one we know best, probably the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son, if you've got an older version. Uh, early on, you have the parables of the lost sheep and of the lost coin. And I had read these for years, like all of us had. I, the parable of the lost son has always been one of my favorite ones. The idea of this son who's gone away and the father who runs out to embrace him and there's this reconciliation of relationship. I love the story. Uh, the lost sheep, I kind of get. The coin, to a degree, yes. Although, if you're looking for the lost coin, if you were just to go through my truck, you would find several of them somewhere, I'm sure. And so it doesn't quite click with me as much. But something I hadn't really thought about until probably about seven or eight years ago is that each of the lost things within these parables became lost in a different way. Uh, and 
Uh, the guy who baptized me when I was an eighth grader, Dave Miller, preached a lesson about this at my church in Searcy probably about eight years ago, and then I think did something with it here in our summer series a year or two ago. And so I want to kind of go from where he was as we introduce this to where I feel like God wants us to get with the idea of the law. So first of all, uh, the first story in Luke 15, starting in verse 1, it says, The tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. So you've got all these sheep, uh, and I, I'm not a shepherd by any means, uh, but the idea of having a hundred and 99 are still there, and one has wandered off. There's a small part of me that thinks, that's pretty good odds right there. I, we, we've done well. 99 out of 100, I'd be happy with that on a test. And yet when you think of this one that has wandered off, there's a concern from the shepherd for that one. And so he goes off, and he seeks it. And now in the sheep, uh, what you have, sorry, is one who is, at least I think, unintentionally wandered away. Uh, I, don't, I don't see sheep most times in scriptures being the conniving ones. Usually that's the wolf. Uh, so I think the, the sheep was not thinking, oh, I'm, I'm going to wait till he turns and now I'm going to get away. I think the sheep was just being a sheep uh, and kind of wandering further and further and just kind of easing his way over until suddenly he realizes he's all by himself. And he may be looking around trying to find the other sheep, but just finds himself out there. Then we have the coin. It says, what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that was lost. And here, again, you have this lost thing. I was thinking of this story yesterday when we were getting our riding mower out for the first time this season. I've been putting it off. Uh, my neighbors have their house on the market, and so I thought we need to make sure our lawn looks nice in case anybody comes to look at their house. And so I decided to go out and mow. I went to the Home Depot, bought a new battery for it because I had to charge it a bunch of times last year. thought I'll just be ready this year. Put the battery in, went out there, got ready, and then thought, I have no idea where the key to the riding mower is. It's not in the place where I usually keep it. It's not in the second place where I sometimes keep it. And so I just start searching everywhere for the key to the riding mower. And uh, we have already put the dog up, so she'll be occupied, and I don't want to keep walking by the dog over and over again and get her worked up again. And so we're looking and looking, and finally at one point I think, oh, I have an idea. And sure enough, there, there's the place that it was. My wife actually found it. I didn't need to tell you that part, but anyhow. Uh, we found the key, and there was much rejoicing and then lawn mowing and then sunburn. Uh, but with this one, you have one who is carelessly overlooked. Okay, so we're beginning this idea of the lost with, sometimes when we think lost, we think people out there in the world in general. I want us to think as we begin of people we know who have known Christ, People we know who are, were at one time Christians, followers, and for whatever reason, they have gone away. And in the first one, we see someone who has wandered away. And then here we see someone who, someone should have caught this before it got too bad. And we have all probably been there. Uh, we have all realized, you know, there's, there's somebody that used to be here, and we were pretty close, and I should have called them before it got this far. Uh, I should have visited, I should have done something to make sure they knew they were loved, to, to see if there was a problem of some kind, and now it's been so long, it's kind of awkward, and we just, we forget. And for this woman, she is much rejoicing when she finds that coin. Uh, and then there's the last one, the story we know the best, the prodigal son. And this son decides, I want my, my uh, inheritance, I want it now, I want to go out there uh, and live the good life, and the way it's described more there in Luke 15 is that he squanders it. He takes all that money and he blows it pretty quickly, and then he finds himself just at the low of lows. And in the midst of feeding pigs, which was unclean in a very literal sense because it's pigs and he's out there feeding them the slop, uh, and unclean in the biblical sense because he is there around these pigs that are unclean animals, he's as bad as it can get, and he just thinks, if I could just be a servant for my father again, that would be a much better life than what I have now. And he goes back and he probably rehearses his speech in his mind of what he's going to say, and when his father catches a glimpse of him, he runs to meet him. And there's no time for the rehearsed speech or the apology or any of that because his father is just so excited. And, and the words of the father in Luke 15, 24 are, this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. And so here you have someone who chose to walk away. 
And we know those folks too, don't we? We know people who know better. We know people who have been solid Christian followers of Jesus. And for whatever reason, they decided, I want to live my life in a different way. I'm going to leave all this behind, and I'm going to do something different. And those people make us sad sometimes, and they frustrate us sometimes, and we would love to see them come back, but it just seems like they're so against it, we can't imagine a situation where that comes together. And so you have all of these people who are lost, or things that are lost within the story, but lost in different ways. Some carelessly, some just overlooked, some who chose it. And for all of those, what we learn in Luke 15 is, God cares about all of those incredibly because what is the result when they are found every time? Rejoicing. What do we throw parties over? You know, what do we get so excited about that we, we have a big gathering and we're excited and we, we celebrate? There are big, important moments. We had one this morning, an incredibly important moment in a young life, and we celebrate that. There's something changing in life. There's something that we just want to recognize. And here throughout Luke 15, over and over again, the constant theme is these things are lost, these people are lost, and then when they are found, there is a celebration that comes with that. So how do the lost relate to the life of Jesus on earth? We, we have all kinds of debates uh, about what did Jesus come for anyway? We, we understand the idea of the sacrifice. We celebrated that this morning. Uh, we understand that there's a love of God that brings him here. But in one place where it's just spelled out completely for us, in Luke 19, he says, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So if Jesus were wanting to bring it down to one sentence, of why am I here? It's to seek and to save the lost. It is so important that, you know, there's 99 sheep that are fine and one is lost. It's so important to Jesus that he comes out of heaven to earth to seek and save the lost. So what did Jesus teach about making disciples? And how does that relate to all of this? And we looked at a little bit of this last time, but it, it'll help to set up where we're going. Uh, passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, as he's choosing uh, disciples, we read this this morning. Alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. So first of all, uh, there is, sorry, there is a promise that we become disciples who make disciples. That's what these disciples are going to do. You're going to follow me, therefore you're my disciple, and then I'm going to make you into fishers of men, which is to say you are, more, you are now making other disciples. When we look in Scripture at the promises of God and the promises of Jesus, we generally think of things like uh, salvation and love and heaven and all of that kind of stuff. Here's another promise of Jesus. If you follow, this is something I will make you into. And then, uh, in the end of his life, and we looked at this last time, I think, he said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So it's a promise at the beginning of Mark, and he also says something like this at the end of Mark, but at the end of Matthew as well. Here it's a command. It's a command that you're going to be disciples who make disciples. Now, for us as followers of Jesus, generally speaking, if we were to go to Scripture and we were to find something that is a promise of Jesus, we'd want to pay close attention to that, wouldn't we? And if we were going to find something that was a command of Jesus, we'd really want to play, pay close attention to that one. But what if something is both? It's a promise and it's a command. We should have this highlighted and underlined and an asterisk next to it and flags out on the outside of the Bible so we never forget where to go to for this because this is unbelievably important. And yet for so many people who follow Jesus, this is one of those things that we just begin to assume other people do. There are people who are trained for this. There are people who are good at this. There are people who know more than I do. And for all of those reasons and many others, this is not the thing I'm supposed to do. There are all kinds of other things I'm supposed to do, but not this one. And yet we see here it's a promise and it's a command. And then in Acts 1, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He's talking to his disciples, but I think we can take an awful lot from this, especially in the second half. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Evangelism and sharing the good news and discipleship, however you want to look at it, whichever word you want to use, this is God's plan for spreading the message. There's not another one. I've heard someone say that this is God's plan A for getting the word out. There's not a plan B. This is it. And so for each of us, as we receive this promise and this command, it is so important for us to get on board and to be a part of all of this. This is not a program. This is one of our mistakes within churches, and I will tell you, this is not 
unique to churches of Christ. I think all kinds of groups do, uh, struggle with this thing, that they feel like, okay, here's an evangelism program. And maybe you thought uh, last week when I introduced to you that we're going to be talking about evangelism for a few weeks, that when we got to the last Sunday night in April, I would introduce to you the program that we're all supposed to go out of here and do. There's not one. Uh, there hopefully will be some things that each of us can look at and maybe be better about this than we are today, but there is not a program for this. And unfortunately, throughout the course of time, there have been all kinds of programs, some of them successful, some of them not, uh, some of them with some permanent impact on people, some of them not. Uh, I can remember when I was a kid, uh, there was a church in town that had the, uh, the Bible questions phone number that you could call, and you would call this phone number and it would give one of those uh, Bible lessons to you. And it was like a recorded thing. Uh, I always imagined like a reel-to-reel on the other side. It was not long ago. And it would run through the thing, and then it would get to the end, and it would say, if you'd like to uh, get this question mailed to you and answer the, the questions and send it back, we'll grade your thing. And, and it did all those kinds of things. And I, and I, I did, because I was a kid, and I was just eating up Bible. And I, I thought, this is kind of cool. I, I wonder how that would go today. Uh, the, first of all, the idea of a phone number that you call into and you'd have to text something, I'm assuming, and they would text you back and all of that. Things have changed. Times have changed. There have been times where it was a door-knocking program. There have been times where it was all kinds of different things. There have been times where every church had multiple gospel meetings every year. It was just the way things were done. And for a lot of us, we miss that. Uh, we miss those times. I remember as a student at Harding, uh, when I was the D-team volleyball champion, as a student at Harding, we would have the spring and the fall gospel meetings at the college church across the street. And whoever was speaking over there would come in and do chapel for a few days that week. And it was a neat thing. And I think gradually, as time has gone on, that has begun to fade away. And they had some good preachers with good lessons. And for whatever reason, times have just begun to change. And so why I say this is not a program is we have tried programs. I, I would imagine, I've only been with you for four years now, I'm sure you have tried programs too. And some of them have probably worked, some of them haven't, some of them have been a short-term exciting kind of thing, but gradually, every program fades. Good as it is, exciting as it is at the beginning, they all fade at some point. So this is not a program. This is a way of life. I want you to think again about what Jesus said to uh, the fishermen there in Mark chapter 1, his disciples. I will make you become fishers of men. Not, I'm, I'm going to teach you a man-fishing program here. Not, I'm going to teach you a way to, uh, this is the step four, five, six, seven, eight thing that you do, and you get to disciples. I'm going to teach you to become this. This is not a thing that you do. It is who you are. So we looked last time uh, at this book, The Master's Plan for Making Disciples, and last time I showed you the negative side of why do people not do this. And if you weren't here last time or you didn't watch last time, uh, feel free to go back and watch that. Uh, it's a little more of a downer. Although my wife told me a few times it really wasn't that negative, so I'm, I'm glad. Uh, but it was more of, uh, less of a solution and more of an analyzing the problem kind of thing. And there are a lot of reasons we don't. And some of them are valid and rational and all of that. But they can't be enough. We can't just rest on those and say, well, that makes sense, so let's not do it and we'll move on with life. There has to be something that we do. And so here we have the principles for making disciples. Uh, these are nine principles. Uh, there are lots of ways we can look at that, this. Uh, and when we get to week four, a couple weeks out, uh, we'll have some more practical things too. But here, I want you to consider some of these just general principles for what we can do to make disciples. Now first, uh, disciple making is most effective when it is an intentional response by the local church to the Great Commission. Okay? So as a church... I hope you get tired of me talking about this. Now, get me right on this. I really don't hope you get tired of me talking about this, but I hope you hear it so much that you think, okay, he really doesn't need to say that again. Because I really need to say that again. This is so important to the mission of Jesus in the church that he repeats it. He makes it one of the last things he says. It is a promise and a command. It is, it is just who we are supposed to be. And so, as a church, I hope if someone comes and visits... Uh, and they're here for several Sundays, that they couldn't be here more than two or three Sundays without hearing something about this. It works its way through all kinds of things that we talk about. And the reason for that is, if I can convince you of nothing other than Jesus and his love for you and the demand of a response to him because of that and being baptized into him, this is the next thing in that line of if you believe those things and you have been baptized and begin to follow him, then this is the thing we do because of that. This, this is who we are. 
this is more important than the fact that you're here right now in my mind, and I want you here right now. Uh, this is more important than you're watching right now, if you're watching at home, even though I want you to watch right now. If we are just watching, if we're just here and we don't do these things, we are missing something. So as a church, I hope that we understand just how important it is to us as a church, that we believe the importance of evangelism. Uh, second, and that one's smaller, sorry about that. Uh, disciple making is most effective when focused on the natural networks of existing Christians, which is to say, you know people who I do not know. Uh, every week I get Facebook friend requests from people, uh, like a lot of you do who are on Facebook, and sometimes you will look at them and you'll think, I have no idea who that person is. Uh, there is a thing, by the way, if you are male, that occasionally, uh, I would say at least a couple times a month, you will get a Facebook friend request from someone you have no common friends with who is dressed in a way that you wouldn't want them uh, to be here in church with you, uh, although we want anybody to be here, that sounds wrong. Uh, they're dressed in a way that doesn't look like they're here in church with you, and you think, who is this person? And you realize it's just one of those, it's like your car's extended warranty, they're trying to scam you in whatever way, and so you delete that one and move on. And then you get friend requests from people, and the first thing I will do when I get one from somebody with an unfamiliar name is I will click on there, and I will see how many mutual friends do we have. And sometimes that number is two, and sometimes that number is 202. And when it's the 202, I think, okay, I probably either know this person or I'm connected enough that I can click on, yes, I'll be their friend and it will be okay. And then in between, I start to wonder. It's interesting to me that when I look at your friend list, and I do, I do that sometimes for whatever reason, uh, I will see that you were friends with me and we have 150 mutual friends, probably most of them sitting in this room. And then I will look at your total friends number and it's 874. And so what I have learned immediately is, you know 600, I didn't do the math, 600 and something people that I don't know. You have a group of friends that I don't have. Now, as you multiply that among everyone who is here, and everyone who's not on Facebook, by the way, who also has real friends that probably aren't 600 and whatever, but you have real friends that I don't know, we cover a lot of ground as a group, as far as people that we know. And there are people that you are friends with that I may or may not ever meet. I, I may never know them. They may never hear a word that I say. But you know them. And so disciple making works well when it relies on those people. The fact that you know people I don't know. I know people you don't know. And rather than gather them all and try to get them to one person to tell them all of those things, we work on the people that we know. And we tell them about Jesus. Uh, now this part is so important, by the way. There are eight things that reinforce this. Uh, sorry, there's a couple lists tonight, but I, I think it's worth going through. Uh, number one, it's natural, okay? This is not a, like if you're in sales, this is not someone gives you a list of contacts. This is not cold calls, uh, if you're that. Uh, I did sales for about a semester when I was in college. It was awful for me. I'm not a salesman. Uh, and I did not like cold calls. It was not one of those things that I enjoyed doing. And my sales numbers proved it. Uh, it was just not something I was cut out for. If you know people, you don't have to worry about cold calls. This is not a knock on a door and you don't know who's on the other side. These are people that you know. Two, it's cost effective. You don't have to pay for advertising. You don't have to pay to get a group list of people. You don't have to pay for anything. You know people and you already have relationships with them. Third, it's fruitful. All of the research that has been done along these lines over the last 50 years, it always, always, always comes back to relationships are the number one thing on the list. Uh, it is, there are people in that list that say, I heard a great sermon. I went to a gospel meeting. Somebody I didn't know knocked on my door and we had a great conversation. I went to a church for a Bible study about whatever. Uh, it was a mission work, whatever it may be. There are always those things on the list, but the number one thing is always relationship. Mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, neighbor, friend, coworker. These people told me about Jesus and because of that, here I am. Uh, four, it provides a constantly enlarging source of new contacts. So the magic of you have that friend who has all those mutual friends, when that person becomes a disciple of Jesus, now it's all of their mutual friends and all of those 600 people on their friend list that you don't know. And it keeps growing and keeps growing and keeps growing. You would almost think there was some wisdom in the way that God designed this, wouldn't you? That all the programs we could come up with, all the ideas we could come up with, it just seemed like the next best thing and here we find ourselves all the way back to what Jesus did in Mark 1. And I would argue with you, by the way, all the way back to what God did in sending Jesus in the first place. Because he sends Jesus to get a group who then gets a group who then gets a group who then gets a group. 
This is God's design. It's the reason it makes sense. Number five, it brings the greatest satisfaction to participating members. Okay? To see someone baptized is an exciting day. I, I was excited this morning. I love when services end that way. I was not as excited as Glendale was. I guarantee you. Uh, and not to, to sell short my excitement, but I guarantee you Glendale was more excited than I was. Because he has a connection that is much deeper than mine. And not as excited as Paula was and Greg was and everyone else in the Hatton family was. There is something about seeing someone that you know and you care about, family, friend, coworker, neighbor, led to Christ, that just charges you up. It, it affects you in a way that nothing else does. And so when it is these people that we reach, not strangers, and I'm all for re me, uh, reaching strangers, by the way, nothing wrong with that. But when we reach the people we know, it does something for us and reinforces the fact that we can do this. Number six, it results in the most effective assimilation of new members. Okay, we read about the sheep that wanders off. You know which sheep has the most difficult time wandering off? The one who has some close sheep friends around them. Now, I don't know that this is how sheep work, literally, but this is how church works. It's one thing to just be here and to show up and to leave and then eventually to wander off and do something else. It's another thing to be here and show up and to have lunch with people and to be here and show up uh, and be a part of a, a, a group that studies the Bible together. To be here and to show up and be a part of a group of people who, who takes a trip together or who goes out and does some activity together who, who are neighbors, who are family. When you are that, it is much, much more difficult to wander off. Now, that's not to say it's impossible. We have a parable right there in Luke 15 where it happens. But it is much more difficult. Uh, number seven, it tends to reach entire families. When you reach someone in a family for Christ, the first people they want to reach, their family. We, we read about that with the Philippian jailer last time. Philippian jailer is about to kill himself and then realizes his prisoners are still there. He is baptized, and who gets baptized next? His family. He reaches out. And number eight, it uses ex existing relationships. God has given you these people in your lives. I truly believe that. He has given you these people in your lives, and this is one of the many things that we can do as a result of that. Okay, back to the original list. Number three, discipleship is most effective when based on and permeated with love and caring. This, this is Bible. Uh, we have not... Looked at scripture with every one of these, uh, but think of the words of Jesus here in John 15. These things I command you so that you will love one another. How do they know we're Christians? Love. So when does discipleship work best? A and why, by the way, does it work best when it's natural and not a program? Because sometimes programs, the easiest thing to forget about is love. It's, it's so step by step by step by step you forget. This, this is love that is doing this. It is God's love for us and our love for others. Principle number four. Disciple-making is most effective when each Christian has a part in responding to the Great Commission. This is the thing we should all do. There are so many things in the course of our worship time together that are not participatory, okay? Hopefully, you're all listening to me right now. That's always my hope every Sunday when I get up here. Most of you probably are. Some of you probably aren't. Uh, maybe you are now. There, I've told you. I don't know. But you're not really a participant other than the listening. Uh, occasionally, there's an amen. Those are fun. Uh, but for the most part, there's not a participation. There is when we, led, when we had songs just a little while ago. There is, hopefully, if your minds are connecting with the prayer as we pray. But much of what we do is you sit and someone else does something up here. This is a place within the life of Christianity that we all participate. This is something we all do as a church. So as we do this together, there's something about doing instead of just watching that makes us a little more of who God made us to be. Uh, and also, this reinforces our doctrine. How many times have you heard growing up in the church, for those of you who have been around a while, or maybe if you're new to it, you've heard it as well, uh, every member a minister. Uh, the idea that we're, we don't have a clergy and a laity, we don't have, uh, you know, s the preachers are not somehow above everybody else. We all are in this, doing this together. This reinforces that idea. Uh, honestly, when, when we gear everything around, Let's bring everyone to the preacher so he can teach them about Jesus. I, I'm fine teaching them about Jesus, by the way. Don't get me wrong. But that reinforces something that we're actually not doing the rest of the time. We, we, we totally talk about the idea that it's we're all ministers. We all do these things. And so this reinforces that idea. And also, I will tell you, this is spiritual maturity. We have conversations so many times about what does it mean to be spiritually mature. There was a time within churches that we gauged that based on attendance. And so we would look and we'd say, okay, uh, you're the Sunday night crew, okay? So you are at level two or level three. I don't know how you want to put it. Uh, you're a level above the Sunday morning crew. No offense, Sunday morning people watching at home. 
uh, you're a level above because you're here on a Sunday night. And there's a smaller percentage here Sunday night than is here Sunday morning. And then we will get to Wednesday night. Uh, and we will talk about church organization this week. Uh, when we get to Wednesday night, that is the level three or the level four folks because they are Wednesday night people. And that's an even smaller percentage than was here Sunday night. And we have gauged spiritual maturity around that. Uh, and we have talked about, okay, if somebody's going to be a leader in the church, is that a person who's here on Wednesday night? Because we, we just even unconsciously think spiritually mature equals how much you're here. I'm not trying to sell attendance short because if you stop attending, I don't have much to do up here. And I totally get that. But this is spiritual maturity. What, what you do for three hours a week is not spiritual maturity. This is. Studying your Bible, your prayer life, but even more, I think, because your Bible and prayer life, quite honestly, is going to lead you here. This is spiritual maturity. Being disciples who make disciples. This is what Jesus trained his followers to be. And when we are people who are spiritually mature, this is what we do. And if we're not doing this, we need to do more. Principle five, disciple making is most effective when it is a team effort. Everything about church leads us back to the idea of community. God is in community uh, with the Trinity as we read about in Scripture. God has designed his people for community. Remember, it's not good for man to be alone, and so he makes him uh, a way to be in community. All throughout Scripture, his people are doing things on their own. When they try to do things themselves, generally it's a disaster. And this is another place where, what if, every time we stop, there are conversations going on in this room. And I love that, by the way. And I've watched that happen more and more as we become back together. What if we kept running across conversations in this room as we close where people were talking about the people they're trying to lead to Christ? Where people were talking about, you know, my one is Jim. And Jim, I had an opening last week. And I was able to talk to him about this thing about the Bible, this thing about Jesus. What if as you were walking out, you kept hearing those conversations? Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be a neat thing to realize that we are all trying to do this? This is something that as, as this begins to catch on, we will realize this, this is not just who I'm supposed to be. We're, we're all doing this. This is something that we do together. And the things that we do together are better, aren't they? Anytime we've tried to start something good in life, that we've had someone walk alongside us in that, hasn't it been easier to keep it going? <clears throat> From the whole body. We read this last week, but I think this is reinforced here. Joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. The idea that we do these things together is a very, very biblical idea. Number six, disciple making is most effective when it is church-centered. Again, we're together in the sense that hopefully a few of us here and there are together on this, but also we need to be reminded this is something that is important to our church. I would love for a hundred years from now for the Southwest Church of Christ to be here and for it to still be growing and active and a force within the community of Ada and people notice it and realize something good is happening here and the way we get there from here after all of us, not all of us, there'll be some of us who are still here, but a lot of us are gone, is this. When we as a church believe that disciple making is important, this church will never die. It will continue on, continue on, continue on. Uh, and more churches in the world could use that right now than ever. Principle seven. Disciple making is most effective when unique needs and individual differences are recognized and celebrated. Okay, remember, when we read about uh, in Romans 12, conforming and transforming. We are transformed, not conformed. I know we feel like maybe we're conforming to Jesus in some way. We're transforming into what Jesus wants us to be. We're not conforming to what the world is. We need to recognize that people are different. And those differences are things that God can use in a good way. Uh, each of us comes into this room with different talents, abilities, skills, backgrounds. And instead of trying to mold us all into one thing that all looks the same, we need to recognize that there are differences among us. And Paul does that. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 9, he says, To the weak... I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. Paul sees that people are different. And when you see Paul come into a community, he sees that. Uh, he sees the things he needs to talk about, the things that they're familiar with. And for us, we have to do the same thing. This is why, by the way, a program doesn't work long term. Because a program is for a given time and a given place, and that changes. 
And so all of those things, as they change, we adapt, much like Paul did here in 1 Corinthians 9. And I do it for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. Why do we, why do we change who we are? Why do we recognize the difference in others? For the sake of the gospel. It's not just because we are wishy-washy or anything like that. We are changing for the sake of the gospel. Principle eight. Disciple making is most effective when biblical insights and church growth research are integrated. This is the most technical sounding one of the eight. I almost left it out. I'll be honest with you. What this means at its core uh, is we should recognize how things work, which is to say, if there are disciple, disciple making programs that have worked at one point and we begin to recognize that they don't now, then we adapt. For us to continue to do something that worked at one point and doesn't work now just doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, and at the same time, when we find things that seem to work really well, then we do those things. And understand, by the way, this is all, as Paul just said, for the sake of the gospel. We're not talking about changing the gospel. We're not talking about changing our doctrine. What we are talking about is, if something is effective with the world today, how can we go about doing that in a way that honors God? And that's a struggle for us. And more than that, you know what the struggle will be? If we come up with that, and it is exactly what we think it should be, and it is very successful and works very well, five years from now, we will still be holding on as hard as we can to that. And five years from now, it may or may not work anymore because our world is changing so fast. Uh, we, when I was in Searcy, we started this Backpack for Kids program. I, I say we, someone at our church did. And the idea was uh, kids get school lunches while they're at school and then they get to the weekend and their family doesn't have the food for the weekend. And so what we were doing was providing a weekend's worth of food for a family in a backpack uh, for a month. And so people would gather this food, and they would bring it in, and we had just tons of food everywhere for that. And we would fill up backpacks. And there were like 50 backpacks as we started out, and there was so much food, somebody said, we've got to buy more backpacks. And so we bought more backpacks and filled those up. And we did that really well for about six months. And then after six months, less food started showing up. And then someone said, you know, we have a Sam's membership and food's cheaper at Sam's. What if we just had people bring money for this? And then we will put money in and buy the food. And so then that was done for a while. And then as things tend to go, one person ended up going to Sam's, buying all the food, packing all the backpacks, putting all the backpacks in the church van, taking all the backpacks to the school, giving them to the kids. Now, I'm sure all those kids and families appreciated it. But what that started out as and what it ended up as were two very different things. And for probably about a year, we fought very hard to keep doing the backpack thing because we want to keep doing the backpack thing. And we didn't realize that what it had done had kind of run its course. And sometimes evangelistic things are that way. The way we go about doing it shifts over the course of time. Um, I love the Jewel Miller film, strip, film strips when I was a kid. I have to be careful because I'm actually friends with Todd Miller, who's one of Jewel's kids. Um, Jewel Miller film strips were awesome. And when I was in sixth grade Bible class, uh, I got to turn the eight millimeter projector. Uh, it would ding on the record, and my job was to turn it, and I felt important. And I would turn from slide to slide. Could you imagine sitting down with that with somebody today? Now, it would be retro for about a minute uh, and be something exciting and different and be like putting a Viewmaster in front of somebody. What is this thing? And then gradually it would kind of wear off. And you know what they did, by the way, with the Jewel Miller film strips? They put them on VHS. They put them on VHS, and the Harding Chorus, when I was there, sang backgrounds for it. We were ooing hymns in the background. And then after a while, they put them on DVD. And now you can download them. And they are still, by the way, a fine way to teach Bible. But for a lot of people in our world today, they immediately think we're outdated when they see them. And again, no, no offense to Jewel Miller film strips, because they're a very good thing. But people have come along and decided, maybe we could make videos that look a little more like today and do the same thing. And so they have. For a lot of us, it's hard to let go of one thing and grab onto another. And here, when we see, here's something effective, here's something not, to not pay attention to that doesn't make any sense. Uh, consider the master's reaction in the parable of the tenants. Okay, you've got the, these, these tenants that are each, uh, I'm sorry, parable of the talents. These guys are each given different amount of talents based on what the master sees in their skills, I think. Uh, and they increase them except for the one who went and buried his. And so for the first one, the reaction is, well done, good and faithful ser servant. You've been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. And for the second one, same thing. Well done, good and faithful servant. 
The third one, the worthless servant is cast out in outer darkness in a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You've got three guys that are given something to do with and three different reactions, which is to say, as you see the job in front of you, we have to adapt to the situation. And although burying it just to make sure it's there when he comes back might seem like an option, clearly it's not the option he's looking for. And then principle nine, disciple making is most effective as a natural and continuing process. It is not a program. It is something that we begin to learn how to do and then continue to do and continue to do and continue to do. And it will look different for each one of us. It is, it is just what we need to be as Christians. First Peter chapter 3, uh, this is, by the way, one of my favorite verses. I think I've mentioned it to you before. Chapter 3, verse 15, it says, In your hearts honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So if you were to always be ready to say it, what we learn here is this is who we are. This is not a thing that we do. This is not a program that we get involved in. This is who we are. Now, when we see someone doing what they were born to do, have you ever said that before? Isn't it neat to see? I think of that the first time I watched Michael Phelps in the Olympics. Uh, here's a guy, and they were explaining all about him. Uh, he eats as many calories in a day as I eat in a week. And somehow we don't look the same based on that. I don't know how that works. They showed his hands and his feet, and they're gigantic. They showed the way he is built perfectly to move through the water. They showed all these things he just does naturally, and then other things he learned how to do. And then you watch him win gold medal after gold medal after gold medal after gold medal. He is doing the thing that it seems like he has been designed to do. And I imagine when you get out of that pool after those medals, that's got to be an unbelievable feeling. I think I've, I made the example of Jason this morning with the horses. Uh, and you just don't understand until you've seen it. But I look at him doing that, and I think he probably teaches people how to do that and has horses that are trained to do that. And if he put me on one of those, it would be the funniest YouTube video you'd ever seen. And I would have no clue what I was doing. And the horse would be like, what's up with this? I don't think I could ever get there. And I don't know, maybe, maybe you convinced me I could, I don't know. But when I watch him doing that, I think this is, this is a thing he's born to do. There are things like that for you that are not big public things, that when you do them, you, you solve a problem at work and you think, this is what I was born to do. You're a teacher and you have a student come to you and they get the thing you've been trying to get through their head for a while and you think, this was a good day. This is what I was born to do. A lot of people just wish they could do those things all the time. As a Christian, this is it. Th that feeling we have this morning with the baptism, yeah, that's big. Making disciples is what you were born to do or maybe what you were born again to do. You are someone who is a disciple who is called to make disciples. I asked Jason before mentioning this one. When I looked at his videos of him riding horses, what I found while I was there was not all the videos were about him riding horses. There were some videos that were him sitting behind a desk, big cowboy hat on. I thought about trying that today, but I decided not to. Cowboy hat on, and as I looked at the video closer, Bible in front of him on the desk. And Jason spends about 12 to 15 minutes teaching some truth about the Bible and oftentimes using something about the horse life as his analogy for that. He taught through the entire plan of salvation. I, I watched it uh, and I thought, I just taught about baptism a few weeks ago and I didn't do it as well as he did through those videos. How cool is that? You can actually take the thing you're good at, and God made it this way, by the way, and you can take that and turn it into the thing that makes disciples. This doesn't have to be a program somebody else invented. These nine principles are good things. They're out of a book. The guy who wrote it was smart. I get that. But in your life, there are ways you can make disciples that the people who wrote this book never thought of because they don't know the people on your friends list. They don't know who you are and what you bring to the table, but God does. And God has equipped you to do this job. So tonight, if you're not, you are like most Christians around the world, by the way. There is a study that uh, nine out of ten people say that if they were asked by a church member to come to church, they would say yes, but they haven't been asked yet. Could you imagine? Isn't our assumption that they would say no? And, and yet there it is. 
And the fact that 9 out of 10 people say that means 9 out of 10 people, there are a lot of church members that are on their friends list that just aren't asking. If you are not an evangelistic person, let me, if nothing else tonight, convict you of the fact that that is not an option. It's not because I said it. It's because Jesus promised it. He was going to make you this. And Jesus commanded it, and he tells you to do this. And don't forget about your one. As we close, I heard a story last week, and I won't name any names. If you think it's insignificant what we're doing back there by writing somebody's first name on a piece of paper and dropping it in, do you know that a couple meetings back, we prayed for someone by their first name in the elders and ministers meeting, and do you know that in the following week, they attended a church service in their town for the first time in a long time? Isn't that cool? I have found over and over again that when you pray about something, God acts. And if you think that's a small way to start, maybe it's a small way to start, but it's a real way to start. Tonight, if no one has ever invited you to follow Christ, I apologize for that. Someone should have by now. And we would love to see you follow him. We, we saw it happen this morning. It'd be great to see it happen again tonight. Or tonight, if you are like one of those lost things that we read about, one of those lost people that we read about in Luke 15, I would love to see you found tonight. And if you are, there is a great celebration that will take place in heaven. If you need to come to him tonight, please come while we stand inside.